Hello, I'm Professor Ian Hickey, and I'm joined again this afternoon by Associate Professor Elizabeth Scott for the second in our educational seminars on the Brain and Mind Centre's youth model. On this occasion, we're focusing on combining clinical stage and pathophysiological mechanisms to understand illness trajectories in young people. As we set out in the original first of these series, we really want to focus on how do we develop a more precise, a more personalised approach to the individual clinical care of each of the young people that comes through our systems. I'd like to start by, of course, recognising the traditional owners of the countries on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on which the Camperdown campus of the University of Sydney and the Brain and Mind Centre is placed. And also of the lived experience of particularly many young people and their families who have sought mental health care and unfortunately have had very varial experiences of how that has been. Just to recap, in the first of the series, we focused really on the dimensions that are important to us in understanding the common mood and psychotic syndromes that most often emerge during adolescence and young adulthood and then tend to go on and have long-term consequences. There are key elements to the model we propose. Firstly, it's highly personalised. Second, it's measurement-based. It tries to treat the problem as it is now, but also prevent progression to more severe forms of illness. So one of the core concepts is in fact that of multidimensional assessment. We don't just assess a particular illness or seek to assign a diagnosis. In fact, we really assign a specific diagnosis, broad syndromes, but we're also looking at people's impact on social and occupational functioning, the extent to which they're at risk of self-harm through suicidal thoughts and other behaviours, the extent to which they may have concurrent alcohol and other substance abuse, the impacts on their physical health, as well as our potential to prevent progression to a more significant and impairing mental disorder over time. In picking out these dimensions, we really have emphasised those that are most important to young people and their families. And it does require us to just consider the clinical complexity in each of those domains as we set out to try and find, in partnership with young people and their families, the most effective interventions. So in this particular seminar, we're gonna deal with the bane of our life, diagnostic classification. Elizabeth, what do we do with that DSM thing? In the bin? Shred it. Shred it. Shred it. And then? And then start again and start again with something that actually helps us to understand the problems that people present with and to target treatments more effectively and to have some predictive idea about what the predictive um, uh, you know, elements are of, of the disorders that people have that might indicate which treatments are likely to be effective and in what combination. So if you're hoping to come to the seminar about early psychosis, bipolar disorder, specific anxiety disorders, eating disorders, borderline personalities, post-traumatic stress syndromes, you come to the wrong seminar. Unfortunately, for those who like that kind of pseudo specificity, we operate in the trans diagnostic world. When young people have emerging syndromes, they often have all sorts of mixtures of anxiety, hyperactivation, sleep-wake cycle disturbance, psychotic-like symptoms with other associated sets of problems. These days, we avoid the specific just by referring to the transdiagnostic. And we put within that those emerging syndromes. They are syndromes, and they're quite specific to each individual, syndromes of the common overlap between mood and psychotic syndromes, which then tend to progress in adolescence to more significant lifetime disorders. In order to provide some sense amongst that entire otherwise hazy picture, we've tended to adopt two concepts and work on them over time in, in partnership, particularly with Origin Youth Health and Professor Pat McGorry and his colleagues to refine firstly, clinical staging and second, pathophysiological mechanisms. Just to deal with the second bit first, we're not saying when we say transdiagnostic that everything is the same. It's just one big soup that there's nothing in there. But we are saying, unfortunately, after now 40 years of attempts since 1980 to develop an international classification system that would bear some relationship between the clinical phenotypes we see in the underlying neurobiology and the prediction response to treatment, that the current categories do that very poorly. It is likely that there are underlying developmental trajectories, individual risk that we need to understand, and we propose some of the common ones to further look at. 
But a really useful place to start is to say whatever it is, it isn't all the same all the time. That mental health problems emerge through earlier phases of illness before they become distinctly syndromal and before they become persistent and progressive. The notion of clinical staging is one which is unapologetically knocked off from cancer, from cardiovascular disease, from inflammatory arthritis and other areas of trying to find the earliest forms of illness, the syndromes at their earliest phase, which would justify intervention with two goals, treat the episode or the syndrome as it is and prevent progression to a later syndrome. Really big challenges in this particular area of adolescent onset. Just gonna share with you at this point, the experiences of one of the mums of the kids we look after. It took 16 years to make it to the BMC. My daughter was physically unwell since birth, but as she was loved and cared for, educated, well-groomed and in a stable environment, she looked amazing also. Her physical health was never taken seriously until she became psychotic at the age of 16 years old. After years of investigation and treatment by the BMC, it was found that her mental illness had a physical driver and cause of her inflammatory brain disease. Prior to leading um, to ending up at the BMC, I had tried every avenue available to me, even a witch doctor, I would say. I think that was the last straw. We experimented with combinations of natural and conventional medicine, diet and exercise, the list goes on. Nothing worked until we started receiving treatment at the BMC. And whilst it has been painstakingly slow, we have made enormous progress towards recovery. If you say the right treatment is the model available at the BMC, it took us 16 years to get there. And my husband had to beg to get an appointment at the point where at 16 years old, she was very ill. Once we got that treatment, we were on the right track. The treatment, it was a long process of working together and was very slow, but it took 16 years to get that ill. It was going to take many years to get better. And she did. Liz, so since you're the one who actually did something useful here and worked with the families, do you want to comment on the issue of how much people struggle to actually get assessment and then working in partnerships in care? So I think some of, the, some of the major difficulties arise for people with very early onset of very severe disorders, which are particularly with psychotic disorders, where it's very hard to access um, treatment systems. So I think the pathways that people have to navigate, even in major uh, cities, teaching centers are still extremely difficult. And the danger is of people having very prolonged periods of untreated illness and gathering diagnoses and gathering um, disability and it becoming harder and harder to tease out what the original problems are. I would, I would say that if you put in place the type of multimodal assessment that we've been talking about early, which takes into account people's physical health, it takes into account their sleep, it takes into account some of their kind of genetic vulnerability and their family history and we look at the we look at their a lot uh, some of the kind of inflammatory and metabolic markers that people carry you are able to you are able to see these patterns emerge very early on and able to provide the effective treatments that need people need to actually recover so even though these syndromes that we're talking about are quite severe and they're not that common they carry enormous amounts of disability and suffering and we have the potential to actually intervene early and put people back on a better track Kathy's daughter is now has finished university and living independently and is a great example of how somebody with a very severe illness can actually go on to a very productive life. Another important aspect Kathy's talking about about 16 years is recognizing in childhood some prior vulnerability and then in adolescence becoming very unwell. One of the other important things you talk about clinical stage, clinical stage is not the same as developmental age. You can have a really bad condition when you're really young. I think one of the problems with epidemiology at the moment and some developmental psychiatry is just an assumption that certain things are gonna have an onset at a certain age and they're just a developmental variation. The illness paradigm says, look, developmental age throughout here is very important when something brain development, pubertal development, social development, but some people get illnesses so that they're at a very late stage of illness, even though they're very young, and others can still be at an early stage of illness, even though they're older. 
So as we go through this particular seminar, clinical stage does not equal developmental age. Although in managing care, the two need to be resolved. It took 16 years to make it to the best. So in our model, the two factors we want to go on and discuss further here now are clinical staging and pathophysiological pathways. And hopefully bring the two together. What's the driver? What's the illness mechanism? Not developmental itself, not development itself, but what is the pathophysiological driver that is making this particular young person unwell? Can we get a hold on that? So we target our treatments towards it and understand its ramifications. And at what stage of an illness is a person at? So we'll talk about what we're really trying to do is pick up people at the earliest stage that we can to effectively treat to prevent progression to the next stage. So this is one where we're looking at this in both uh, its elements as an individual clinical treatment, but also trying to combine it with, in fact, clinical service development. You'll see various clinical staging models that talk about staging for bipolar disorder, for psychosis, for anxiety disorders, for eating disorders, as if when you stand at the edge of the road, parents know exactly which clinic to go to before they know what's actually going wrong. And the staging only applies to that. In the services in which we work, we encourage much more of an open door to come in that door and actually try and achieve the really most important thing, the right level of care relevant to your stage of illness and type of illness, pathophysiology, at the first point of contact, not to go through endless assessments where you fail, you get something generic that pays no respect to stage or to pathophysiological mechanism. If everyone gets befriending, if everyone gets the same cognitive behavioral therapy, if everyone gets the same SSRI, that more or less says we pay no respect to stage or pathophysiology. We just simply give the same aspirin to everybody and wait for things to go wrong. That for us is wrong care many times before getting to the right care. So the clinical stage concept, now this is applied at the individual level. This is for individual people. Now there's a stage zero, which by definition isn't in clinical care. Stage one for us is people who come into clinical care. They've got syndromes, they're health care seeking. But there are people out in the community who are at risk. Strong family history, kids who may have grown up with developmental difficulties, people who may have had low birth weights, they may have exposure to childhood infection. They may have known risk factors. So if you look at that group as a whole and you want to study them, they would be a group at higher rate of progression to actual illness. In clinical care, the earliest possible presentations, the stage ones, which we divide into 1A and 1B, are help seeking, but they have not yet developed a full blown or full threshold major mood or psychotic syndrome. So the red line across the middle of this chart differentiates those from a, what we see as essentially risk of progression from those who have actually developed major syndromes and as a consequence of that have major functional impairment and are likely to recur, persist or progress to more severe disorders. So stage two, three and four is mostly what adult psychiatry deals with. Well-developed syndromes, people over the age typically of 20, 25 in various phases of chronic illness entirely deserving of best care, but the opportunity for earlier intervention or prevention has largely passed. We differentiate stage one and one B because of differential rates, or we propose differential rates of progression to stages two and above. Stage one are those people who actually, one A, are those who are help seeking, typically with low levels of anxiety, depression, Distressed, may have suicidal thoughts and behaviours, but low degrees of concurrent impairment. The, one of the groups that we are most interested in are the stage 1B, which we refer to as attenuated syndromes. In many other classification systems, and particularly in psychosis, people talk about people being at risk, as if the person doesn't already have anything. And in some of the critiques of early intervention, implying that we treat people who don't have syndromes, they're simply at risk. At risk in this model is actually stage zero, preventing the onset entirely. Here, stage 1B are people with real syndromes, 
with already degrees of moderate to severe functional impairments. I personally think one of the great contributions of early intervention psychiatry and psychosis led by Professor McGorry and his colleagues was to point out how functionally impaired people were before they reached our thresholds for first care. Whatever we said about their symptom levels or the syndrome levels, they were already in plenty of trouble in school, in function, in employment before they developed the syndrome. The syndrome wasn't driving the impairment, the impairment was already there. So for us, this is a key differentiation. A lot of our work is focused on people in the 1B area, trying to prevent progression to stage two. But also on stage two, when you have your first episode of illness, there may well be inflammatory, metabolic and other factors taking place where you really need that first episode to be treated effectively, to reduce the chance then of recurrence, progression or persistence of that illness. Liz, do you wanna talk a little bit about just focusing on that area, getting people in, and also, if you wouldn't mind saying, how hard it is to focus on that area where it's not clear cut? Uh, in the sense of the, in, the, in those, in, those 1B syndromes you mean? There's no clear diagnosis there. Take that DSM, throw it out the window. There's no clear idea about whether you should prescribe, not prescribe, you should psychological therapy, not psychological therapy. Should we do anything? Your critics are all on your back, leave them alone. Wait, wait, wait. And then when it's bleedingly obvious, they've had their first manic episode, they're admitted with psychosis, they've attempted suicide, they're in terrible trouble, they've been out of school for two years, then you can help. So I think it's been an area of great controversy and I have to say an area of, of criticism. Not enough to outweigh the fact that when you actually provide treatments to young people in this, gr in this group, they actually do well. And to be able to prevent somebody going on to a more severe and disabling disorder is a huge incentive to continue. So I would say that despite controversy and criticism, it's something that we've persisted with. And that's based on treating large numbers of young people through our Headspace sites who present with, with very overlapping syndromes. So a lot of noise in the system, which often makes it very hard to, um, to, be, to personalize care. But, but what you see are the patterns emerging which enable you to identify those young people who do have more impaired circadian uh, rhythm for instance who do have more manic type symptoms with more unstable periods of activation and low activation or with psychotic type symptoms and the cognitive difficulties the cognitive dysfunction that characterize those people who are at more severe who are at risk and that enables us to out of the noise be able to see the patterns of illness that identify who are those people going onto a much worse trajectory to be able to intervene much more assertively and consistently and to track those young people over time to make sure that they do get back on the right track. Another criticism of this area is those who say we are stigmatizing people, we are labeling them and we are condemning them inevitably to progress to worse illnesses. Not true. In fact, the model does not in any sense say it is inevitable that you'll go from being at risk stage zero to stage one, having a syndrome. It specifically does not propose that the majority of people who have either stage 1A or 1B will progress to more severe syndromes over time. It highlights at every stage the potential to abort that process in those groups who may be most at risk. But as most people would be aware from other types of modeling where we treat hypertension to prevent stroke, and we prevent heart attack, where we intervene in certain areas to prevent further progression, we intervene in early stage breast cancer to prevent progression over time, that actually there's a number needed to treat to actually reduce the chances of progression from a business as usual or a normative type state. And we are involved in continuous evaluation of that also important to say in the staging model, you can't go backwards. Just like once you've had cancer, you can't say, I haven't had it. I now go back to being at risk. Actually, you have had it. Your vulnerability is revealed to the extent to which you can do it. But, but we strongly support the notion that you can potentially recover and resume functioning at any stage with appropriate treatment. But intrinsically or implicitly, the further down the stages you are, the more likely that treatment is to be intensive, to be prolonged, and probably associated with greater risk in terms of pharmacological interventions, and that the extent of full recovery, full functional recovery, may be less in those who have already undergone long periods of chronic illness and decline, and the development of comorbidity, particularly in the alcohol and drug area, 
and physical health domains. So just to run through the stages in a little more detail, the zero is the asymptomatic, typically people with family history, first degree relatives, birth weight, childhood, uh, risk factors and other developmental disorders. If you want to study any of those groups as a population, they would go be at higher risk of developing mood and, and psychotic syndromes as teenagers. The one A's are basically those largely around non-specific symptoms of anxiety and depression. They still have a syndrome. They're still presenting for care. They're not just having a bad day. They have significant other features in those particular areas. Typically though, they would still be functioning at school or employment or in their other wider world and have typically shorter durations of the disorder. The attenuated syndromes are more severe. And in these particular areas, you're more likely to see the manic-like symptoms that Liz mentioned, the psychotic-like symptoms, quite non-specifically, I might say, circadian disturbance, other physical health change, more likely to see evidence of neuropsychological impairment, which is interesting as to whether that's pre-occurring or is developed as a consequence of illness already, lower current educational and social functioning, more likely to meet diagnostic criteria for some disorder or another, but not to have developed a full-blown syndrome. In this particular group, people may meet a DSM criteria for an episode of an anxiety or depressive disorder, but we are not saying that that necessarily means they've already reached a full threshold mood or psychotic syndrome, or that they will inevitably go on to recur or progress or persist. Really importantly, they don't really fit any diagnostic group. They just have features which suggest, as Liz was saying earlier on, that they may be at increased risk of actually persistence. And they have a syndrome that justifies active intervention at that point to treat it, to restore function and prevent, if we can, progression to stage two. Stage two really, really should be that at which we do our best. These are not transient, they're not self-limiting, they've got major impacts on social occupational functioning. They look more like the classical disorders, more likely to see manic-like disorders, more likely to see bipolar-like disorders, more likely to see psychotic-like syndromes. One of the problems about a focus on at-risk syndromes or attenuated syndromes is in no sense, in no way, are we saying there should be any less emphasis on effective treatment of the first episode, if we can. Some of the inflammatory and immune issues that Liz was highlighting earlier on are clearly most severe during this particular period. And we wanna protect the organ that matters to us, the brain, in long-term, treating the first episode effectively from all points of view is a key goal. We then talk about uh, the extent to which within those particular disorders, there are breakdowns and we start to be more specific about uh, their relationships with the type of disorder. Now, just to be clear, the most common ones here are still anxiety and depressive disorders, but with much more uh, characteristic or severe phenotypic features in each particular episode. And we have criteria for within each of those, how you would differentiate them. Generally speaking, of course, it says they're established and they're severe. What we do is then follow people, over the, particularly over the next 12 months, see what the course of disorder actually is, see whether there's incomplete remission or recurrence, what happens with functioning and the extent to which we have been able to arrest the otherwise progressive decline in social functioning associated with persistence of illness. And then the last stage is typically that of severe, persistent and unremitting illness. Now, important to say, even in that group, that does not mean that without effective treatment, people, well, sorry, with the provision of effective treatment, may, people may recover. It does mean without effective treatment, the chance that they will recover is very low. Spontaneous recovery is very low. But in my lifetime, for example, the introduction of clozapine has made a tremendous difference to people with stage four type illnesses. As has happened in cancer, with the discovery of Herceptin, for example, in breast cancer and other areas, in malignancies, in melanoma, it doesn't rule out the possibility that in fact, effective treatments may well be found. But at the extent with the knowledge that we have now, if we can prevent people reaching that particular point, we should try. So in terms of how to do it, how to differentiate people, it just isn't that complicated. The young people you see, the first decision you need to make is basically, have they gone over the line? Do they already have 
a well-established first episode of a severe mood or psychotic syndrome. If not, you go back to the stage 1A versus 1B. If they're in the stage one categories, you don't think they've reached that. Are they in the less severe, less specific 1A category? Or have they actually got an attenuated depressive, bipolar, psychotic, or very severe comorbid type syndrome? You'll have arrived at the particular point. If they've already developed a severe syndrome, the next stage is simply to look at how long and how persistent, how recurrent that has been. So what can sound very complicated in real life, clinically, just isn't that complicated in terms of assigning initial stage to a person who presents. There's been a lot of discussion recently, just what's the evidence base for this stuff in mental health and how applicable are these paradigms from cancer, from cardiovascular disease, from other areas. There are some really good recent publications. I'm very proud of the work with Professor McGorry about clinical staging in psychiatry, much of it based on our own work and that in colleagues in Melbourne, as well as international colleagues about clinical staging. Uh, another great book recently uh, edited by Stephen Wood from Melbourne about youth mental health also takes up the issues of clinical staging in great detail. For those who want the short order but high impact, go straight to The Lancet and actually look at the global series on mental health of Vikram Patel's summary of the way forward in mental health classification and diagnosis and you'll find the diagram very similar to ones we've got ourselves on clinical staging and its relationship with pathophysiological mechanisms. So despite the noise that sometimes exists around these models, and they are still at early stages of development and validation, there is already a wealth of evidence. And as Professor McGorry would say, if he was here, frankly, what's the justification for late intervention? I mean, in what other area of medicine would we think that late intervention was a good idea? Liz, is there any justification for late intervention? I think there is no justification, certainly from the point of view of the young people and their families who are desperate for care, most of it by the time they get into any service, there is no justification for delaying that any further than it already is. Well, that's pretty straightforward. So here's a model of where we're currently at. And if you think it bears some resemblance to that which appeared in The Lancet in 2018, I suggest you go back and look at our brain and mind uh, publications in uh, Biomedical Biomed Central, BMC, back in uh, 2013 and the development of these models as they have. Now, what's important about this model, again, I'd like to emphasise, is the middle part about implied non-progression. The majority of people, young people who have trouble as adolescents will not progress necessarily to a more severe illness over time. And how those various syndromes come together is complex. So you'll see the staging model down the screen to the left as we've just described. In the middle, you'll see the colors that represent for us basically in red, neurodevelopmental pathways that are more likely to result in psychotic syndromes in the long run. Kids who grow up with brain developmental problems are more likely to end up with psychotic syndromes. In the middle is the hyperarousal or anxious depression or what used to be called neuroticism, you know, central nervous systems that react to life events with high degrees of distress and arousal. The most common forms of anxiety and depression over time. And on the right, you'll see the circadian or sleep wake cycle disturbing categories in green. The ones Liz and I are particularly preoccupied, the ones classically associated with bipolar disorder, atypical depression and other circadian related syndromes. Now, early on, the mess of colors in the middle is indicate we don't think these are mutually exclusive. The waste of time of many psychiatrists re-diagnosing someone as having a psychotic syndrome or having a depressive syndrome, or they've got a depressive syndrome saying, no, they've got an anxiety disorder, or they've got a bipolar disorder, or a bipolar two disorder, or a borderline personality. This, how many professors of psychiatry waste their time re-diagnosing your patients? How many of my patients have their time wasted by professors of psychiatry? <laughs> particularly professors of psychiatry, I think are particularly prone, depending on the particular clinic they run and their particular preoccupation to say everybody else was wrong. And now my bipolar two or your early psychosis or somebody else's OCD is actually the right syndrome. If you look at what we have at the top level of this chart, you'll see symptom clusters, things like low mood, fatigue, psychomotor change, uh, auditory hallucinations, you'll see the syndrome ideas. And a lot of network analysis is now going on around the world. People are trying to understand the way that these different clusters emerge and then condense into the syndromes that we see. As you move below the line, 
as you move below the line, you see the development of more classical type syndromes and things that we would start to see as more obvious psychotic episodes or we see as more obvious uh, manic episodes or classic disorders. So that what we classically end up in a DSME type world is in the stage three and four, we're talking about mood syndromes, anxiety syndromes, bipolar disorder, et cetera. On the right of the graph, we've tried to show concepts related to what the illness is doing, the impact it's having. Earlier on, less impact, less comorbidity, less neurobiological change. So a lot of our studies at the moment are in tracking across stage, the extent to which those other dimensions are continuously changing or being impacted by progression across stage of illness and in relation to the pathophysiological type that we've proposed. One of the really important issues for us and, and validation of stage is what actually happens in terms of the particular recovery rates. Where did people start? and what happens to people. So basically, as implied in the original classifications, and sadly, as tracked over time, you can see it is possible to recover at any stage, the blue line in each graph, but the proportion of people that functionally recover declines. So for the stage 1A, you see a figure of 54% there, 1B, 32%, and for stage 2, 24%, a lower proportion. Or at the moment, putting it the bad way around, at stage two, only, uh, well, step, only 24% recover, but 76% do not function and recover. For stage 1B, 68%. And I think this is one of the really big arguments that critics of this area just need to get over. How could you possibly stay to the stage 1B that 68% of those two thirds would not function and recover, even receiving the kind of standard therapies we currently look at? So for us, this supports the general notion that stage is predictive of functional recovery, or in this case, sadly, the lack of functional recovery. But even at the earliest stage, stage 1A, kids who are chucked away all the time as saying, fail to fit the threshold for care, can't discuss those particular issues, 46% do not function and recover. 46%, half don't function and recover. All of these people have a need for care, but their chances of full recovery are actually considerably related to the stage at which they present. We have done a lot of research. I think Elizabeth's led most of the research on many of these areas, on now several thousand young people cross-sectionally and longitudinally in all of these particular areas. The clinical domain, the longitudinal studies, the neuropsychological correlates, the brain imaging correlates, and the circadian correlates. Much of the work is still cross-sectional rather than longitudinal and validates the concept of stage. It's always worse on each of those domains for later stage, which are defined clinically. We don't define them by those other parameters, but it's typically later on. Increasingly, our work is in fact longitudinal in actually studying the patterns over time and the extent to which, guess what? The brain changes over time. The circadian disturbance gets worse over time. Certainly the functioning gets worse over time as the syndrome gets more severe. Important work to conduct at the moment, we do do the treatments that we do. We are trying to find better treatments to in fact change many of those parameters. The other concept then, we're gonna stop and dwell on a little bit here, is not the stage, but these other pathophysiological mechanisms. To make life simple, rather than 100 different DSM diagnoses, there are three kind of core concepts that we suggest. I must say increasingly the genetic evidence for these three and the other objective evidence grows in support of three big common elements. One's neurodevelopmental. Many of the kids by the first time we see them clearly have had lifeline, lifelong difficulties with brain development. They struggled as kids, they had neurodevelopmental problems, they had childhood syndromes that were suggested either in the ADHD spectrum or the autism spectrum or the learning difficulties and are more likely to have cognitive features even when they present with psychosis or mood or other sets of particular symptoms. So there what we see is the neurodevelopmental group. Parents know, compared with their siblings, they're often had much greater problems as kids. And then the challenges of adolescence and the further developmental issues are associated with their particular mood and psychotic phenomena. The middle group, which is actually the most common, is that of anxious arousal what used to be called neuroticism, what's called sensitivity, that which is associated with cognitions, with worry, obsessionality, 
a lot of thinking on the inside. Liz, your favorite group? Certainly the commonest group that we see, the young people with lifelong. So you see it from early childhood, but each child getting a different diagnosis as they, as they progress through different stages of their kind of childhood and adolescence, but with the essentially the same kind of phenotype running through it. Anxious, anxious, anxious. Anxious, anxious, anxious. Different Separation anxiety. Social anxiety in teenagers. Yeah, so social anxiety is, in fact, the most common disorder of teenagers because anxious kids suddenly have to leave home, go form relationships, deal with the world in other ways. Guess what? Social anxiety, best dealt with by boys, by alcohol and other substances, girls who worry, who ruminate, etc. Mothers, parents, very accurate describing this kid's worried their whole life in different settings, at different ways, in age appropriate ways, which becomes more depression and becomes more mood related actually as time progresses. And extremely important to recognize and manage effectively because of its impact. I mean, much underrated in terms of its impact on functioning still, much dismissed still by specialist psychiatry. My personal favorite and the one that Liz and I have spent the most time with is circadian disturbance. And a long time in my life wasted with looking at fatigue syndromes, not wasted, but actually intrigued by chronic fatigue, post-infective fatigue, disturbance of sleep, wake cycle, everything that people said wasn't a mood disorder with its somatic features. Now much more increasingly understood in terms of perturbed sleep, wake cycles, leading to so-called atypical depression, associated with fatigue, oversleeping, delayed sleep phase, more associated with unstable mood, more subject to seasonal change, more triggered into actually the extent to which is a discussion about energy, it's a discussion about activation, it's a discussion about being active. In fact, if you go back to Burton's classic, The Anatomy of Melancholia, it's about being active, much more than about being sad and being inactive and being dysregulated and moving between activity and non-activity, between being energetic and non-energetic on an ongoing basis. We now understand much more about the management of that particular area, though still poorly recognized, but critically, critically changes profoundly during the adolescent period and people who are probably at risk genetically and in other environmental circumstances of developing disorders. Just roughly about 50% of the kids that we see sit in the middle category, hyperarousal anxious. So the majority of kids you see have that. It really worries me continuously the extent to which they are dismissed because they also have suicidality they're also at great risk, they have impairment. But you know, often if they're anxious, they're told not to worry. Often they're told to press, they're often just told to get on with it. So the ineffective treatment, and a lot of the work that we have at the moment, which does not provide appropriate cognitive behavioral therapy skills development, problem solving, other interventions in that area, major problem. Fortunately, probably the group that does respond best to SSRIs if they get that as a generic treatment. The other two groups, really, really require much greater focus on what are the relevant treatments that they require. And both of them are probably more likely because of their seriousness and their relationship with the more classic bipolar and psychotic syndromes that when fully developed, more likely to receive specialist care. Better care gives us a greater opportunity at living fulfilled lives without the constant burden of mental ill health. Sam's a great guy. Previous National Mental Health Commissioner, still out there trying to argue for young people, grew up in the country, didn't good, get good care. And the point that also Kathy McCabe made earlier, it often takes young people and their families a tremendous amount of time to get anywhere into a system where people are sort of prepared to have the kind of discussions that we are having. And also I might say, prepared to say, I don't know. I don't know what it is at this stage. I certainly don't think it matches any DSM group. Liz, what do you do with the explaining I can't tell you what the diagnosis is. We're just going to have to work it out. So I think doctors particularly find it extremely hard. Doctors and other clinicians and find, it, of psychiatry. find it extremely hard, hard to say, to say what we don't know. We're much more likely to try and fit people into the boxes that we feel comfortable with. So being able to say, these are the things that we do know. And these are the things that we do know in relation to your brain development and what's happening in your brain at this time. But we don't necessarily know where th this is heading down the track. We do know that if we can treat some things, we can treat these things and we can change the course of sleep and improve certain things that we know that we can improve the situation. Sam is a very good example of that, of a young person who presented with very severe depressive, a very severe mood disorder and who had atypical symptoms. And it was not until that was identified and treated 
differently from the treatment that had been receiving in increasing high levels of antidepressants, increasing combinations of treatment, that he really started to get better and improve. So one of the other key issues here, and uh, several conferences and meetings I've been at, people go, you've got to give it a name, Ian. You can't say these are at-risk mental states, attenuated syndrome, stage this, stage that. People want a thing. I often wonder who wants the thing. I think the clinician wants to feel powerful and others want to know it's a thing. These are diagnoses. We are saying people have syndromes, but we're often saying you've got the syndrome that you've got. And we're going to stick with you focusing on that, which is the focus of treatment, as Liz just highlighted, whether it's the circadian features, the atypical features, the psychotic syndrome, and we will work with you to find the treatment that's relevant to your syndrome. So one of the issues we have to be careful about here is actually don't fall into the trap of saying what you haven't got, but actually what you have got, although it doesn't fit the books we've got, you've got it and we're working with you to try and change your life course. So in this rather complicated kind of diagram, I just want to point out that the, the pathophysiological mechanisms that we've been talking about often have different manifestations at different ages. Some kids might even be worrying in the womb, certainly their mummies, that might be the genetic contribution to their particular issues. Liz was just saying, once anxious, always anxious. Separation anxiety as a kid, social anxiety as a teenager, panic agoraphobia as an adult classic trajectory of the same central nervous system mechanism across different life phases. For the circadian bipolar one, which is all about rhythms and about regularity of body systems, lots of feeding difficulties, sleep-wake cycle differences, attentional difficulties for kids, often as children, but puberty comes along, more likely to be associated with fatigue, sleep-wake cycle disturbance, depression, and an unstable mood, periods of activation, hyperactivation. For the developmental, lots of developmental contact issues, learning difficulties, other perceptual difficulties, translating into more psychotic phenomena as kids move through. So the top part is all about the trajectories of age-dependent phenotypes. Same vulnerability playing out as different phenotypes at different ages across that pathway. And of course, there are risk factors to all of these particular issues, operating environmental influences that are operating in different ways, Hard to become alcohol and substance dependent until you've been exposed to alcohol and substance dependent. Other factors which do involve actual important uh, problems in the earlier sets of phases. And of course, there are maternal issues. We are looking at, of course, the intermediaries, what is happening in terms of brain development, hormonal development, sleep-wake cycle development, immune system development across all those phases. So there are different biologies going on at different periods. It's not surprising. It's a bit complicated. And in some ways, people say, oh, you can't possibly have this discussion with people. You can't just give them a simple diagnosis and move on. And go, no. Actually, we find actually providing people with some explanation of the complexity of what is taking place actually better matches the reality of the situations they're actually operating under. So we can actually look at people over time. And I'll just move fairly quickly through the next set of empirical slides of over 2,000 young people. We can map the proportions where they are when they come into care, what is happening in most of the early stages. Mostly we do see people in the our early onset headspace type services who are 1A or 1B, where they go over time, the extent to which they stay in the same categories over time and the transitions. Very importantly in the work that we've been looking at is the extent to which the, the attenuated syndrome group, approximately 15% of those people do progress over time from the 1B category to 2. There's a certain degree of progression from 1A to 1B as well on an ongoing basis. You can start to track people individually. Could ask the other day, statistics, not about people? Go, yes, it is about people. You can show people where they are. Can't say what they are, but you can say, if this is where we are now, you've got an anxious syndrome, we can track over time. Do you stay in that particular category? For some of the people who start in particular areas, particularly anxiety, but then develop a more psychotic-like disorder, we can see. More commonly still, they start with what looks like anxiety, like depression, but they become more circadian-like or more bipolar-like over time. You can actually track with people the type and the stage over time. Oh, wow. Just back. Ellie, Pam, say hi. Hi. Kathy and her family were very keen to show, you know, what for 16 years had been very difficult, well-treated, well-managed, not by me, by her, 
and, and, and a team of people and a focus on the individual and the complexity of that actually leads to what we're really looking for, functional lives. The Brain and Mind Youth Centre has been the best treatment and care I could have asked for my family. Best treatment and care first time can save precious time in a young person's life so they can get back on track and either fully recover or learn to manage a chronic health condition. The specialised physical and mental health investigations need to be done at this crucial time to identify what complex things are going on so they can be treated appropriately and customised for each young person. The model used to treat my daughters allowed them to continue to function in society and deal with chronic illnesses. The continuity of care is vital in keeping the families engaged in their care and treatment and having a successful functional outcome. Having so many false starts to good effective care is damaging and increases the trauma faced by so many young Australians and their families who don't have access to this kind of care. It should be available to all Australians. It works. Well, that's a pretty ringing endorsement, but it does matter. I mean, the great thing I think about sticking with people in this area is, as uh, Kathy's just pointed out, Liz, how long have you been working with that family? I have been working with them for now about a decade, I think, about a decade. And it sounds like, you know, we are this fantastic treatment centre. And I have to say, what we've provided is multimodal assessment and care and multidisciplinary care, something that actually should be achievable, not just in centres like ours, which started out being very well resourced. I, I don't know that we've continued to be well resourced, but should be available everywhere. But also it's highly personalised, or to use what the cancer doctors prefer, it's precision. It says you are an individual. So while diagnoses describe what people might share in common or systems try to take the aggregate knowledge, the application of it is quite individual. So in particular families in this situation, certain psychotic syndromes associated with certain immunological phenomena is at the heart of the particular problem. That actually this willingness to look at stage and mechanism and then say, it's okay to say, I don't know now, but we're gonna do the assessments, not just the clinical assessments and the engagement, and I must say, not just get lost in the narrative, but we're gonna do the brain imaging, we're gonna do the other immune investigations, we're gonna look at your physical health, where to consider what we don't know in these particular issues. And we're gonna take the journey of actually trying to find out what is right with you into the future. And learn from the process. And learn. <laughs> and stick with it long enough to know you're wrong. Quite often, I must say, I turn out to be wrong quite frequently. You think it is something, you think it's some early stage, you think because there's a family history of something, you think because it's got certain features that that's the way it's gonna go. It turns out, it didn't. So some of the most common, for example, arguments I'm lost in all the time is, it's borderline, it's trauma, it's bipolar, it's psychosis. And I go, you know what? I'm not sure what it is. And every time you jump into one of those pools, you turn out to be wrong. The number of young women that we've had who've been called borderline, only to find that when they went on and they became pregnant or they were later in life, as our colleague Jan Scott points out, particularly in young women who have often have their first onset of mania, actually quite a bit later in their mid or late 20s, called borderline for the previous 10 years. Oops, just had a manic episode. Or you see those, in fact, you know, who've been called psychotic recover really well, don't have cognitive impairment on a particular basis. Because someone has been exposed to a risk factor like trauma, it doesn't always mean that that is the syndrome that they've actually got. There are other sets of concerns, considerations and the situation then being complicated by substance misuse and other factors. Substance-induced psychosis. You know, for all the people using substances, if that explained everything, as distinct from kids who are using substances in combination with the syndromes that they had developing on an ongoing basis. Try to use more measures, trying to learn from the research. Where does brain imaging, where does neuropsychological assessment, where does immune assessment, where does physical assessment actually fit into the paradigm is important. At the moment, the more longitudinal studies we do, the predictive significance of psychotic-like symptoms of manic-like symptoms and a circadian disturbance from a clinical point of view is strong. In other evolving work, which we'll discuss later on, 
We might increasingly see polygenic risk scores become more useful in prediction. We might also see some aspects of brain imaging become more predictive in terms of significance. We may well see movements to other sets of treatments. But for the moment, we really want to take forward two concepts. Stage in a transdiagnostic world and pathophysiological mechanisms, which may well be the principal driver in a, in a particular person, but they don't really correspond with the existing diagnostic categories. So in further parts of these, uh, of these uh, seminar series, we'll go on to explore the further uh, processes in terms of longitudinal prediction about prognosis, but also about selection of treatments along the way. But in an otherwise fuzzy world, and I must say, the number of psychiatrists that say to me, if it's that clear, I'm not working in it. <laughs> I'm going back to somewhere I'm comfortable. Just please on the upside. It's murky, it's gray, it's confusing, but would you work in a different area if you had a choice? It's incredibly interesting. And the capacity to learn from what we don't know and to try and look at things in different ways and to use skill, skill and pattern recognition, but also listening to what people say and what they describe and trying to understand the brain processes that drive not only our cognitions and our, our brain systems, but also our body and to look at those them in combination, I think, is our capacity and our skill as physicians. So, thank you. This is part two, more to come. We are very grateful to the support we've received from philanthropic supports, particularly the Future Generation Global, for the support of these issues. And many of the families who continue to fund this work, because Liz and her colleagues, not me, have taken great care of them. They've stuck with really complicated kids, listened, dealt with them individually, tried to place them in a conceptual framework that made sense and then provided effective treatments. I hope you join us for the next training seminar.